And I think we're at that time. So again, welcome to this ISUSA webinar. Today is Tuesday, September 13th, 2022. My name is Jose Francisco, and I'm a project manager at ISUSA. We are excited to cover today's presentation regarding the advancements in oral antiviral therapy for COVID-19. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Judith Currier, Professor of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. We will go over our introduction slides and moderate the question and answer session at the end of this webinar. Welcome, Dr. Courier. Thank you so much, Jose, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it is important to um, delineate that today is uh, September 13th, 2022. All information about COVID has a um, ex expiratory date. So if you're listening to this recording, we'll just keep that in mind. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just have a couple of housekeeping uh, issues to go over. Next slide. So um, the the these webinars are um, developed, the ideas are generated from a board of um, investigators who are shown on the slide and their financial relationships with companies are listed here. Next slide. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Lee's uh, financial disclosures are also listed on this slide as well as mine. And the reviewers um, who reviewed the content, their information is listed here as well. Next slide. CME is information for the study or for this pr uh, program today is included here. Um, the activity has been designated for CME credit, which you can claim at the end of the program. Next. Um, and these are the number of credits for the different types of CME and the instructions for claiming those credits are on the IES USA website shown at the bottom of the slide. The grant support that, may, that helped make this possible um, is provided by the following um, groups and they are shown on the slide. We appreciate the support that uh, makes these programs possible. And the recording of this uh, webinar today will be available on the IAS USA website so you can share with uh, colleagues at, um, at your leisure. We, find that these types of programs are so much more flexible for people to be able to participate when their schedule allows. We are going to have some poll questions today. And when that happens, um, there'll be a separate window that will show up and you can use your response and then we'll see the responses um, of, of the group. Obviously these are not linked to you personally. Um, it also really helps the speaker to see kind of where the audience is in understanding the, the, the topics that are being presented. We appreciate all the questions that were submitted in advance and um, we'll try to get to those, but do submit your questions using the Q&A and it's fine to resubmit a question that you might have sent already um, just to help me prioritize all the questions that come in. Um, the, um, you can use the chat to discuss with other attendees, but please don't put your questions in the chat because I'm going to be focusing on the Q&A area for moderating the questions at the end. So um, without further ado, it's really my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Lee, who is an associate professor of medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, John leads a very productive laboratory as a virologist and is one of the people who during COVID really uh, took a stretch from his HIV work and moved into COVID and has made a lot of really important contributions um, in the clinical translational virology that helps us to understand COVID. So he's really the perfect um, speaker today to talk about oral antiviral um, agents for the treatment of COVID. So John, thanks for being with us and look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Judy for that kind introduction. And I am thrilled to be here with everyone today to talk about oral antivirals for uh, COVID-19 uh, therapy. I am actually going to move ahead to slides. There it is. All right, so I wanna start off with a couple of uh, pre-talk polls. Uh, poll number one, if you have prescribed nermatrovir or ritonavir, otherwise known as Paxlovid, have you prescribed it for more than the five-day course? 
Uh, answer one, if you've, if you've not, if you've only prescribed a five-day course. Two, if you've prescribed a second five-day course for suspected rebound. Three, if you've prescribed a 10-day initial course. Uh, four, if you've done both. Five, if you have not prescribed nematrovir or ritonavir. And six, if it's not applicable. This is just for me to get a sense of, of where the community is at when it comes to um, using Paxlovid. Okay, interesting. So uh, um, most uh, individuals who have prescribed it have prescribed it, uh, the five-day course with a uh, small number, looks like actually 7%, having uh, prescribed uh, an alternative course of Paxlovid. So, all right, very interesting. Good to know. All right, so. Okay, so the learning objectives um, will be one, to describe current COVID-19 variants, subvariants in the US, outline the recommended oral antivirals for the treatment of COVID-19, define characteristics of nermatrovir, ritonavir, uh, Paxlovid rebound uh, syndrome, uh, and lots of additional other topics as well. Okay, so let's go to our pretest uh, question number one. Uh, you have a patient who comes in with questions regarding current COVID-19 antiviral therapy. Which of the following would you inform your patient is true regarding current uh, therapy? Is it one, current oral antiviral treatments include nermatrovir, ritonavir, Paxlovid, monopiravir, and remdesivir. Two, nermatrovir, ritonavir is the only preferred oral antiviral therapy in the NIH treatment guidelines. Three, nermatrovir, ritonavir, and monopiravir are each preferred oral antiviral therapies in the NIH treatment guidelines. Or four, the Omicron BA.5 variant is resistant currently, unfortunately, to all uh, oral antivirals. Please make your choice. Okay, so uh, looks uh, looks pretty widely distributed amongst uh, answers one, two, and three. Excellent, great. Right. So, and then this is our last uh, pretest uh, question. Uh, you're seeing a 40 year old woman with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and recent diagnosis of COVID nineteen. Which of the following is true about her treatment options? Is it one? Nermatrovir ritonavir paxlovid is likely to be of clinical benefit even if she is vaccinated. Is it two? Nermatrovir ritonavir has relatively few drug drug interactions. Is it three? Molnupiravir should be the treatment of choice. Or is it four? She should be warned about the dysgeusia or unusual taste if she is prescribed molnupiravir. Please make your choice. Okay, most people think it's option number one. Very good, All right. Okay, so um, the overview of the talk, we'll talk a little about the status of the epidemic. We'll talk about then focus on dermatrovir, ritonavir, Paxlovid, clinical evidence, COVID-19 rebound. Then we'll go through monopiravir, clinical evidence, and some potential issues with monopiravir, and then talk about what's next. Uh, what is potentially coming down the line that we should be on the lookout for? So current status of the COVID-19 epidemic in the US, we've got uh, more than 89 million uh, cases. Omicron, as I think we all know, accounts for more than 99% of cases in the US. Two thirds of the US population is now fully vaccinated. About 50% of those have received a booster. Of course, there's now the, the new bivalent booster that is available as well. But of course, over the past two years, we have seen again and again, the rise of different SARS-CoV-2 variants. Uh, starting with alpha, then beta, and gamma, uh, and delta, and now Omicron and the different Omicron uh, subvariants. And I will say in the uh, US, we have not been immune to all of the fluctuating uh, subtypes that have come around. And this just shows how dynamic the landscape of SARS-CoV-2 variants has been in the US. And this slide always kind of really 
impresses me every time I, I look at it. And it shows um, the start of the, this is the uh, original genotype and then alpha coming here through the blue. And then if you recall, we actually had the California variant and then the New York variant. This is back in you know 20, early 2021. And then you had the gamma variant coming around and then uh, beta and, and, and then delta as well taking over. And of course, now the Omicron and Omicron subvariants uh, have become the most dominant uh, variant in the US. And within the Omicron uh, genre, there's actually been multiple subvariants that have replaced each other. Started off with BA.1 and then BA.2 and then BA.45. And uh, now there's a, another one, BA.4.6, that has reached about 9% of the population and is slowly increasing. But right now, predominantly, we're at a BA.5 uh, infection. So what are the current antiviral treatment uh, options for outpatients that is recommended? I'm showing you uh, just a, a, a slide from the NIH treatment guidelines panel. And there's really four medications that are authorized for outpatients, two of which are oral and two of which are IV. So the two oral options are here. You've got your ritonavir boosted nermatrovir, which I'll call nermatrovir ritonavir, uh, also known as Paxlovid. Um, and then you've got molnupiravir at the bottom here. So of the four drugs, as two of them are recommended and preferred therapies uh, based on NIH, and that includes both Paxlovid as well as remdesivir. Uh, and then the two therapies that are considered alternative include bepilovimab, which is an intravenous monoclonal antibody, as well as uh, molnupiravir. And we can go, we'll be going into why uh, nermatrovir or Paxlovid is a preferred option, whereas molnupiravir is considered an alternative uh, therapy. And then in the Q&A session, um, if there are questions about remdesivir or betulimumab and the IV um, options, I'm happy to discuss those um, and its place in our uh, antiviral uh, uh, armamentarium. All right, so let's talk about nermatrovir or ritonavir or Paxlovid. So um, on the left here, you see the virion, the SARS-CoV-2 virion, and it has a spike on the outside. It has your nucleocapsid uh, on the inside, um, uh, in, within the spike in the membrane and the envelope, and then the RNA genome as well. And the genome is shown here, and it's about 30 kilobases. And within the genome, there is a gene here called NSP5, which encodes for this protease, uh, also known as a 3CL protease. And what the protease does is that it helps cleave some of the larger protein pieces that is um, translated by, by the virus, these, these polyproteins, this PP1A and PP1AB, um, are cleaved by this protease into a number of different proteins with different functions, and it includes the RNA polymerase, and actually includes the, the 3CL protease itself. But these proteins, these polyproteins, have to be cleaved by the protease in order for um, these um, proteins to be active, these enzymes to be active. Nermatrovir targets this 3CL protease um, and actually binds to it and inhibits the protease activity. Now, what's important is that there is nothing in human cells that is similar to the 3CL protease. So, which is good because it's expected that the normatrovir will have very little off-target adverse effects because there's nothing in our natural human cells that is similar to 3CL uh, protease. In addition, we do have experience with viral protease inhibitors, which we already use for both HIV and hepatitis C uh, treatment. So there is some comfort level when it comes to um, nermatrovir, uh, ritonavir. So as I mentioned, nermatrovir has to be boosted with ritonavir, right? So why is that? Why, why, why do we need the ritonavir? So ritonavir itself is a protease inhibitor and it's paired with other protease inhibitors for both HIV and COVID treatment. Now ritonavir itself actually doesn't have much significant activity against either SARS-CoV-2 and, and actually relatively weak activity against HIV. So why do we use it? Well, we use it because it's a potent inhibitor 
of the cytochrome P450, um, certain isoforms, including um, 2D6 and 3A4. And these are the cytochrome P450 enzymes that help chew up and, and, um, and kind of clear nermatribir as well as some of the, the HIV medicines as well. So by inhibiting cytochrome P450, ritonavir can then boost the levels of nermatribir. And you can see in this particular plot, this plot shows the pharmacokinetics of um, this PF07, it's all these numbers, but anyway, this is nermatribir. Um, and its original um, naming scheme. And this is with a slightly higher dose of nermatrovir here in red, a slightly lower dose, but really what, what keeps the nermatrovir levels high is really the ritonavir, the RTV here. And um, this dotted line here on the bottom is the EC90s at which you can inhibit 90% of virus in culture. So uh, this is um, with the ritonavir and a slightly higher dose of, of the nermatrovir, you can see that you can um, have a much longer duration of activity for nermatrovir. And so that's why you can dose it just twice a day. All right, so when it comes to nermatrovir and ritonavir, where does the data come from to support its role in our, in our current um, treatment guidelines? Well, it really comes from the EPIC-HR study, um, which is a phase three study for outpatients uh, who are at high risk for severe disease. This study was enrolled in um, July to December uh, 2021, so before Omicron, and enrolled individuals who had um, less than equal to five days of symptom onset, at least one high risk condition. Exclusion criteria include prior COVID-19, receipt of convalescent plasma, or receipt of a COVID-19 vaccine. So these individuals were uh, unvaccinated. So. Um, two potential differences from the current population that we're using it, right? So Omicron patients and also a lot of patients who have received vaccines. And the treatment was every 12 hours for five days. Here you have on the right, the demographic uh, individuals, median age in the mid 40s. Um, uh, you can see that um, uh, most patients had symptoms uh, within about uh, three days or less of symptoms uh, before the treatment. Um, and you can see it was evenly split between individuals who were seronegative versus those who were seropositive. So what about the clinical efficacy? Um, this is the Kaplan-Meier plot showing the rates of COVID-19 related hospitalizations or death from any cause. And overall, there was an 89% re relative risk reduction uh, in hospitalizations or death. So a uh, highly significant uh, result and one that um, I think really impressed a lot of people out there. And then if you look at the subgroup analysis, you can see that um, nomatrovir ritonavir was uh, efficacious across the range of different subgroups. So um, just to or orient you, um, this, these um, numbers here, the dots here can represent the median values and the confidence intervals. And this is different from placebo. So anything on the left here is good. It favors Paxlovid. And this is the overall group. Um, you can see a 5.6% benefit in terms of hospitalizations or death from, uh, for Paxlovid. You can see that it was um, actually effective regardless of the timing of symptoms, whether it's one, zero to three days or, three to, or four to five days. Um, it, was in, it was helpful for multiple age groups um, as well, older and younger groups, although um, it does seem like maybe there is a little bit more benefit with those who are a little bit older, but still there's a benefit even for the younger folks below 65. And then um, benefits across the different um, spectrum, maybe a little bit more benefit if you have a higher BMI. So again, similar to this finding, if the more um, clinical risk uh, you have, the more likely you are to benefit from uh, nermatrovir or Um Now there was um, a little bit less of a benefit if you were already seropositive. So that's down here, even though I, you know this, this is a significant difference. So, um, but maybe a little bit less difference of patients who um, are already seropositive. Um, but here, this is patients who had received or expected to receive molecular antibody. You can see that this is the one subgroup where there was not a significant um, benefit with Paxlovid. And this is, I think, one reason that combination therapy with Paxlovid and um, uh, monoclonal antibodies is not currently recommended um, because this is the one group that you don't see a benefit here with the matrivir ritonavir.
All right, what about adverse um, events? This shows adverse events between um, nevatorotonavir and placebo. Generally, they were fairly comparable in terms of any adverse events, 23%, 24% um, here. Now, I will say that there um, were a couple of notable differences um, when it comes to um, nermatrovir ritonavir, and that is the frequency of dysgeusia, the, the altered taste and diarrhea. And I'm just quoting here from the paper that the most, the, the most frequent reported such events among recipients of nermatrovir plus ritonavir were dysgeusia, 5.6% as compared to 0.3% of placebo patients, and diarrhea, 3.1% versus 1.6%. So what is this dysgeusia, this altered taste? Um, what I've heard of it being described as is a, is a metallic taste from the nematurotonavir or maybe sucking on pennies. Um, and I have to say that it, this kind of altered taste is notorious with ritonavir. It's actually well known from the HIV days, especially when we were giving higher doses of ritonavir. Um, both uh, nermatrovir and ritonavir are bitter substances. Um, but I guess the question is, why does it still hang around even after the pill's been swallowed? And I, I think there's some speculation that um, you get levels in the blood, right, obviously, and, and that might lead to maybe some secretions into the, into the saliva. Maybe that is what causes the, um, the, the bitter taste or the, the prolonged bitter taste um, of, of, this, uh, of this drug. So just one thing to note for your patients. Um, all right, so we talked about high risk patients. Well, what about lower risk patients or standard risk patients? Well, um, Pfizer's actually done one such study, the EPIC SR study. So the, the high risk was EPIC HR, high risk. This is EPIC SR standard risk. Now, um, this study has not been published um, yet, um, but what we do have is some info from their press release. So I can't give you a lot of details um, from the study, but what I can tell you is that they enrolled about uh, a little over 1,100 standard risk individuals within five days of symptom onset. And these individuals were randomized to receive nermatrovir, ritonavir, or placebo. Now, how did they define standard risk? Well, they defined it one of two ways. Either individuals were vaccinated, uh, but they had at least one risk factor for severe disease, or they didn't have any risk factors for a severe disease and they were unvaccinated, all right? So two different groups. The, they had a primary endpoint of um, self-reported sustained alleviation of all symptoms and that endpoint was not met, um, uh, no statistical significance. Now, when they looked at hospitalizations or death, they did find a 50%, 51% reduction, but that was also non-statistically significant. It was 0.9% in the nermatrovir group versus 1.8% in the placebo um, arm. Then you can see that, that um, this group really had a significantly lower rate of hospitalization um, than the high-risk group, as, as you would expect, but that that lower risk overall in the placebo arm really made it very difficult to detect a, a difference between the two arms. I think they would have needed a much larger study to be able to um, get a statistically significant result here. Um, and then if you want to say, well, okay, well, what about the two groups? The, um, what about the vaccinated patients with um, at least one risk factor? Well, they looked at that group in particular, 700 participants, and saw a, about a pretty similar 57% reduction in hospitalizations or death um, that was also not statistically um, significant here. So that is why right now, um, nermatrovir, ritonavir, or Paxilvid, is, is only authorized for high risk uh, for high risk individuals and not for this kind of standard risk uh, procedure. Now, I will say that this 57% benefit, well, it, it's not nothing. It just wasn't uh, published. And I before I kind of, you know, I guess say too much about it, I think we really need to see this study um, in its published form before we can really say much more about it at this point. All right, so what else has been in the news when it comes to Paxlovid? Well, that is the rebound syndrome. And you know, Tony Fauci had it, President Biden had it, uh, Jill Biden had it, and it seems like we, you know, in the healthcare community, uh, we all know someone who's had um, Paxlovid uh, rebound. Um, well, what uh, is it? But before we go into it, uh, I wanna ask a, another question here, which is um, based on the current evidence, 
Which of the following do you think is true about COVID-19 rebound after neuromatrical ritonavir Paxlovid? Is it one, caused by emerging drug resistance? Is it two, caused by a lack of immune response against SARS-CoV-2? Is it three, it can lead to shedding of infectious virus again? Is it four, all of the above? I don't think there is a choice five, so I would not choose choice five. Okay, interesting. Yeah, good. So almost equally <laughs> distributed between choices two, three, uh, and four, all of the above, um, with um, a couple people who are, are um, trying to get a laugh out of me and chose choice five. So thank you for doing that. All right. So I will give you the answer, by the way, um, in just a few minutes um, uh, for, for that question. So just uh, hang on here. All right, so viral rebound and rheumatoid ritonavir. So um, that question has been uh, inundated uh, uh, to, to Pfizer. And so Pfizer actually went back and took a look at their EPIC HR study and said, okay, well, what is the rate of viral rebound in our study in um, both the placebo arm and in the nermatrovir uh, ritonavir arm. And now I, I will say that, so I'm showing you their preprint. They actually have published their, their formal paper last week in the New England Journal. I will say that their analysis is, um, and, and the references are at the bottom. Um, uh, their analysis was a little bit complicated, uh, but let, let me just step you through it. So their primary analysis when they're saying um, uh, viral rebound um, looked at this is that in their in their study, participants received five days of treatment. And then day five, at the end of treatment, they counted that as the baseline time point. And then patients had follow-up viral loads at days 10 and 14. So that's five days and nine days after the end of the, the Paxlova treatment. And then they said, okay, what are the chances that patients had both a half a log viral load increase at both days 10 and day 14. And um, this is this their primary analysis, 1.7% in the placebo versus 2.3% in the Paxlovid arm. So this is what they, what they showed as the primary outcome in the uh, New England Journal paper as well. So they said, well, it's about 2% in both arms, so it's not significant, okay? But if you, if you define viral rebound, as having um, as only one of the two time points, day 10 or day 14, really, then you do see a slight difference in, in, in higher levels of, of um, rebound, viral rebound in the Paxlovid arm, 2.4, 4.6. If you do a combined, really kind of in, in a half a log increase at either day 10 or day 14, it's about 4% versus 7%. So I do think that there is a potential signal in there for, um, for a higher rate of viral rebound in the Paxlovid arm, uh, if you look at kind of either day 10 or day 14. But there's a couple issues about this study. And um, one of which is that they only had two post-Paxlovid viral load time points available, only at day 10 and day 14, which is five days and nine days after the end of Paxlovid therapy. What about all the other days? Um, and uh, you know th that were not measured, right? So I think this probably is a baseline level, but that the actual level is probably far higher. In addition, they don't really talk about symptom rebound very, very well. But also what um, I, I think what one issue that this brings up is that we actually don't have a good sense of viral rebound in the absence of antiviral ther therapy and what happens in natural infection. And so I wanted to actually take a, a second and actually talk about a couple studies that we did here. Um, one study that um, we did as part of ACTIVE2, which is a, a nationally funded um, trial um, in which um, actually Dr. Dr. Courier was also one of the, the, the leads at for, for the ACE Control Trials Group. And we really wanted to, first of all, answer the question, okay, what about the baseline rate of viral and symptom rebound in the absence of antiviral therapy? Because in order, we really have to understand that in order to understand, um, get a sense of you know, how to interpret the data that we're seeing when it comes to Paxlovid. 
And so the objective was to determine the natural history of COVID-19 infection and frequency of nasal and RNA rebound and symptom relapse. So again, as I mentioned, we looked at data from the active two outpatient monoclonal therapy and other therapy um, study. Uh, this is a uh, platform trial looking at um, uh, phase two, phase three studies of uh, oral and, uh, or actually let's say uh, IV um, antivirals. And so when we looked at the viral rebound analysis, we looked at two different monoclonal antibody therapies and particularly looking at the placebo arms of the banlutamab and three monoclonal antibody studies. The reason we looked at the, um, um, we used the active two study is because of how intensively the viral loads were monitored. Viral loads were sampled daily for the first two weeks. And then also at week three and then week four, there's also two additional time points. So with the daily viral load sampling, we really were able to get a really detailed look, a granular look at viral rebound. Symptom scores were measured daily for the first month. And so we've got symptom rebound analysis from three different studies, all from the placebo arms. None of these patients received Paxil, just to be clear. And what we found was that viral rebound actually occurred in about five to 12% of patients um, without antivirals. If you use pretty much the same definition as EPIC HR study, we found about 12% rate of a viral rebound versus about 4% rate in the EPIC HR study, the Pfizer study, so higher rate. But because we had daily uh, viral load score, I think that's why we had a higher rate. Um, and then the rate was 5 to 12% when it comes to viral rebound overall, depending on the level of viral rebound. I, I said 5 to 12% because 5% is at 5 logs of viral rebound, and 5 logs is when we can start seeing infectious virus um, shedding. Now, when we looked at symptom rebound, we actually saw a fairly high proportion of symptom rebound. Up to about a quarter of patients had evidence of symptom rebound after initial improvement. And um, this, I think, goes to show that symptom improvement after, during initial act, or, uh, acute COVID-19 is not a linear process, that it does wax and wane a little bit, and that patients can have symptom rebound um, in the absence of even Paxlovid. But that combined high-level viral load rebound and symptom rebound is rare, occurring in less than 2%, 1% to 2% or, or less of participants. So this is high level viral rebound above five logs and symptom rebound after improvement, one to 2%. So I do think that that this Paxlovid rebound is, is real and that it is likely to be something that is um, uh, happening far more um, kind of frequently than, than, than um, what you see here, which is some viral and symptom rebound um, in the absence of antiviral therapy. So what about characterizing COVID-19 cases? Well, here at, at Master Neural Brigham, we have characterized some individuals with um, Paxlovid rebound. Um, and in addition, we were looking particularly at individuals who were had symptoms had improved, their antigen tests had become negative, and then after Paxlovid, their antigen tests had become positive again, and then the symptoms had rebound. And in total, we've looked at so far um, seven patients, and this was published in Clinical Infection Disease. And you can see that um, they, this is a highly vaccinated group that um, in general, the median time from the end of nermatrovir ritonavir, this NR therapy to symptom relapse is four days. So that's when the symptoms came back, four days after the end of therapy. That viral loads were generally quite high here, but then not everyone had to be symptomatic. Actually, one individual had viral rebound without having symptoms. They had a, a repeat antigen positivity on a screening test. And I also just want to show you one example of one such individual. So this is a participant um, who received Paxlovid here in the gray, had symptoms in, in green, and the symptoms resolved around day four of Paxlovid. Um, and then symptoms came back a couple of days later. And this was um, concurrent with a repeat antigen positive antigen test. Uh, and also this is a viral load from the nasal swab. So this is quantitative RNA testing. But in addition, they actually had positive infectious virus that was also isolated. This is what's known as a tissue culture infectious dose 50 or TCID 50. So this is a pretty high level of infectious virus seen in this patient during the course of Paxlovid rebound. Now we did sequence this individual and all the individuals and did not detect any 
resistance against Paxlovid. And actually, this was uh, there's been now been a couple of other papers on Paxlovid resistance, and um, so far, I'm sorry, and a couple of other papers on Paxlovid rebound. And so far, no resistance has actually been detected. Um, and here are the seven individuals, and here I'm just highlighting the three individuals who had um, infectious virus, again, cultured in red. You can see infectious virus cultured in these three individuals. And then one participant here who had um, was asymptomatic, but with viral rebound um, as well. So what about, you know, what about their immune response? Do you think, do we think that there are, that a poor immune response might um, be associated and might explain COVID-19 um, rebound after Paxlovid? And the answer so far, at least, appears to be no. So this is a preprint from the NIH, from Irini Soretti's group. And she looked at seven vaccinated boosted patients with, with um, uh, rebound. And um, the median time was six days after completing Paxlovid. Uh, five, of the, five of the seven individuals had milder symptoms than initially. Um, and actually most patients had lower um, CRP, which is C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker, and also nasal viral RNA levels at rebound. So it seems like for most of these patients, rebound time point had was a little bit milder with lower viral load than initially. Again, she also did not find any treatment emerging resistance. So what about the immune response? So here I'm showing you several different antibody markers. This is spike IgG, receptor binding domain, RBD IgG, nucleic capsid IgG. This is neutralizing antibody levels um, against wild type virus. This is neutralizing antibody levels against Omicron. Red are during the acute infection, here's during the rebound, and this is late in infection. You can see actually levels of spike IgG uh, can be detected during rebound. That nucle even nucleocapsid IgG, and this is largely because this is a, a, um, a vaccinated population, actually. That's why this is high, right? So these patients, they're vaccinated and they've had high antibody levels. So it's not that they were not mounting a good vaccine response, right? So this is a nucleocapsid IgG. So this is only uh, this is not induced by the vaccine. And you can see that during rebound, um, some of these individuals do have detectable and fairly high levels of nucleocapsid IgG. And actually neutralizing titers are actually also you know, pretty good in these individuals as well. So their antibodies during rebound, it looks like they're, they're fairly active. And even T cells, um, this is CD4 antigen specific proliferating T cells Again, blue is rebound. So you can see that against nucleocapsid like membrane, they actually, and even spike, they, you can see some T cell activity. So I just want to circle back to the last question that I posed, um, which is what can explain Paxlovid rebound? The answer was number three, that Paxlovid rebound can lead to the shedding of infectious virus. Um, and it's, the other answers were incorrect because right now there's no evidence that there is emerging drug resistance. Now, uh, and, and also there is, um, uh, and, and there's also no evidence that the rebound is caused by a deficient immune response against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and and, and, and um, if people are interested, we can also talk during the Q&A about how we've actually found rebound after molecular antibody therapy and how rebound and molecular antibody therapy differs from rebound and Paxilvid. So if you're interested, I can talk more about that as well. All right, so I have also previously talked about how um, the initial phase three study was in largely um, unvaccinated uh, patients, right? Well, what happens in the vaccinated patients that we're really seeing in our clinical practice um, today? And also, we, I just mentioned that Paxlovid rebound can occur um, and can be inconvenient, it can have, have um, high levels of of infectious virus. So is it still worth it from, from our uh, current vaccinated patient population? Well, the answer, I think, I think in my mind is still a yes. On the left here is a new paper published by Paul Sachs and colleagues in which they looked at a large healthcare database of vaccinated individuals, 1,100 patients treated with Paxlovid matched by propensity score analysis to those who were not treated with Paxlovid. And you can see here, I'm just highlighting here in red and also in the in the kind of the Kaplan Meyer curves here, um, this is um, the survival probability, and you've got the uh, treated group and the untreated group. Forty-five percent 
relative risk reduction in this vaccinated group in terms of all cause um, uh, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, or death. Okay. And on the right here is a study in the New England Journal by R. Bell and colleagues, in which they looked at a health care, large healthcare population um, in Israel. Um, it's a healthcare organization that covers about half of all of the population. And they compared 3,900 individuals who received Paxlovid versus about 100,000 people who did not receive Paxlovid. And they categorized individuals to those who um, did not have previous immunity. So those who were unvaccinated, never been infected, versus those who had previous immunity. And then by those who are ages 40 to 64 or greater than equal to 65. And you can see that individuals who are unvaccinated, never been infected, really the hazard ratio for hospitalization here, you get very strong benefit um, for both of these groups, and regardless of age, um, about an 80, 85% um, benefit in terms of preventing hospitalizations. Now, in those who have previous immunity, you see something different between the different age groups. For those who are over the age of 65, about a 70% uh, reduction in hospitalization, even those who are previously vaccinated or previously infected. Now, in those who are between 80, ages 40 and 64, you actually don't see a, a significant difference. So now, I don't want this to be misinterpreted to say that um, I, I, I think that individuals who are younger, who are vaccinated, um, should never receive um, a Paxlovid because this age range, 40 to 64, first of all, is pretty broad, right? And there are some additional data um, that suggests that maybe between 50 and 64, it still has a benefit. So I, I think that um, it's between 40 and 64, I think, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a wide group, a wide age range. And I do think that um, for most of the patients we prescribe it for, which is age 50 and over, older, I think there, there could still be a, a benefit here. But this just goes to show that in general, there can still be a benefit in vaccinated uh, outpatients, especially if they have risk factors uh, for disease. Um, I also wanted to just briefly mention that uh, nermatrotonavir has drug-drug interactions, that um, ritonavir is one of the kings of the drug-drug interaction. I, there's too many drug-drug interactions for me to really talk about and, and truthfully for me to even keep track of. And so there's two great resources that I go to for looking at drug-drug interactions. One is the NIH Treatment Guidelines Panel, um, and the other is the Liverpool um, and Liverpool historically has done a lot of um, drug-drug interactions with HIV drugs, but they've also expanded it to nermatrovir, ritonavir, and other COVID drugs, and it's a great resource as well. and can provide a lot of um, recommendations as well. All right, so let's move on to monopiravir. And um, all right, let's start off with another uh, question. Uh, which of the following is true about monopiravir? Is it one, it works by inducing errors during the viral RNA replication step? Two, it's not currently recommended in pregnant patients. Is it three, resistance to monopiravir has been rare so far? Or is it four, all of the above? Please vote. I'm glad there's no fifth choice here. Let's go. Okay, most people think it is all of the above. All right, excellent. All right, let's move on to the next section. All right, so monopiravir. So monopiravir is an oral antiviral and it does induce errors during viral replication. Um, it's metabolized into this N-hydroxycytidine, um, which is also known as NHC. It has a sim very similar structure to the normal cytidine, which is a uh, one of the nucleosides that we use in our, in, in, in our RNA and DNA. So it gets incorporated into the new RNA strand by RNA polymerase, but it's wobbly. It, uh, it's kind of flexible. It has the ability to kind of pair with both um, guanosine or adenosine. So by doing that, it actually induces errors during the RNA uh, transcription uh, step. Um, and it actually has a pretty broad spectrum of activity, similar to nermatrovir or tonavir, right? Both of these have activity against SARS-1, MERS, and other RNA viruses. And so far, at least, it seems to have a pretty high barrier to resistance. 
when it comes to um, the clinical trials that have been out there, the main uh, clinical trial is the MOVE OUT study, phase three clinical trial. Um, this enrolled in May to October 2021, again, before um, Omicron came. Again, um, individual symptom onset less than for five days, at least one high-risk condition. Uh, exclusion criteria include pregnancy, um, chronic kidney disease, receipt of vaccine, again, again, um, unvaccinated group, treatment for uh, five days. Now, DSMB stands for the Data Safety Monitoring Board. Now, they actually stopped the study after half the participants were enrolled because the interim analysis and the results were significant. And they had actually found a 50% decreased risk of hospitalization and death at the interim analysis. Um, but I do want to show you that the final results look a little bit different here. So um, this shows the, um, uh, the demographics. You can see that um, in terms of the variance, uh, there's about 30% Delta, but really no, no Omicron here. And in terms of kind of prior antibody positivity, about 20% um, seropositive, 75% um, seronegative here. All right, so overall, the results showed a 30% lower risk of hospitalizations or death. This is the inside here is just a blow up of the outside graph. And as you recall, nermatrotonavir had a almost 90% uh, decreased risk of hospitalization or death. So really, this is one of the reasons why um, nermatrotonavir is preferred, whereas monopiravir is an alternative um, therapy. If you look at the subgroup analysis, um, you know, again, uh, most of the subgroups kind of overlap here with, with zero. Um, a monopiravir better is on the left. So a lot of subgroups were not statistically significant as opposed to the nomatrovir retinavir where everything was, almost everything was, was statistically significant on the, in the subgroup analysis. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, the effect here is, is stronger in the seronegative group compared to the seropositive group. At first, I thought maybe that was because it's related to how early monopiravir is given. You know, for most antivirals, earlier is better. But if you see here in terms of treatment days, actually giving it early, less than three days, didn't actually, wasn't found to be any better than giving it over three days, between three and five days. So, so it, I think what it, it suggests is that um, these patients were positive, had prior, some level of prior immunity from prior, um, uh, maybe prior infection. Um, and what also supports that is that you see that event rate is also much lower. The number of patients with hospitalizations or death here is much lower in the seropositive group than in the seronegative group, even in the placebo arm. So, um, but also the overall event rate here is pretty high, about 10% in the, in the placebo arm as well. So, all right, but what, what also concerned people, there's other couple of issues here. One was that this appeared to be a tale of two studies almost between the two halves. And when I say the two halves, is that half the patients pretty much were part of an interim analysis where they saw a 50% benefit. And then um, the DSMB then stopped the study. But by the time they decided to stop the study, about 92% of all the participants had already been enrolled. So then they looked at the second half of the study. If you look at the second half of the study, actually placebo arm, uh, there's really no difference here between monopiravir and placebo arm. So this was very strange. And so that's why in total, you see about a 30% benefit. This, I, I can't think of another study that really looks like this. And um, if, if you read the paper, it, it, the authors really don't have a good explanation for it, other than to say that they couldn't find a single reason for it that is probably multifactorial, including maybe changing variants, changes in the underlying patient population. Um, maybe, you know, for example, maybe there's more individuals who are previously infected. Um, maybe some regional shifts in, in where the patients were enrolled. Anyway, there's a lot of hand waving, but we really don't totally know um, why this happened. There's also some concerns about monopiravir toxicity. Um, as we talked about, monopiravir inhibits the SARS uh, replication by inducing errors in, this, in the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Um, and you can see that in this figure. This is um, viral replication. You can see that uh, NHC, again, is monopiravir. This is favipravir. This is uh, ribavirin, so two other antivirals that don't really have a lot of activity in vitro against SARS-CoV-2, but this one does. It decreases um, uh, levels of viral replication as you increase the drug concentration here, but it induces errors, and this is the total error rate here. You can see the error rate goes up 
here. Um, but there's a concern that monopiravir could also be incorporated into DNA, leading to host cell mutagenesis. And this is data from a host cell culture assay showing that monopiravir can induce some errors. This is kind of, you can say this is like error count, right? Error count. Um, this is monopiravir here. This is some of the other antivirals, not necessarily COVID antivirals, but ribavirin, uh, febuprevir, uh, um, anazanavir, uh, lamivudine, tenofovir, and then this is UV light, which does induce errors as well. And so monofuria does induce errors in, in the human DNA. Now, the caveat here is that this study in, um, exposed cells to monopiravir for 30 days, whereas actually in treatment, we're only giving it for five days. So this is a, for a much longer period of time. Um, but also the EUA fact sheet for monopiravir states that when they looked at animal studies um, in rodents, they actually did not see um, any evidence of, um, uh, of, of uh, kind of in, inducing these mutagenesis. But I will say that it is currently not recommended for use during pregnancy kind of for this, you know, for this is one of the concerns. And also this, this, that population was not included in the, in the trial. Now, what about in the real world? Um, it's important to remember that both nermatrovir and um, monopiravir phase three studies were conducted before Omicron, right? So there's been relatively little data on the efficacy of these antivirals with the current uh, variant. So, um, and, but these drugs have actually now been studied in, in retrospective kind of observational studies. This is a study in Hong Kong of hospitalized patients who are not on, um, uh, not on oxygen. Uh, who received monopurator or, or uh, Paxlovid. Now, in Hong Kong, I think hospitalization for non-severe disease is far more common than in the U.S. And I think the, um, and the authors only looked at those who are not on oxygen. And so this is, in some ways, a population that, to a certain degree, mirrors the high-risk outpatients in the U.S. Now, they did not compare the two drugs head-to-head, -head, but looked at 900 nermatrovir ritonavir patients versus 900 match controls and then 1800 monopiravir patients versus match controls. And what they saw, you see here, there's about a 52% reduction in, uh, in death uh, for monopiravir versus 66% reduction in death for um, nermatrovir. So some real world evidence that with Omicron um, that um, uh, these drugs can, can still work. Now, what about uh, resistance? Now, I wanna say that when it comes to monoclonal antibodies, uh, one of the defining features has been how fragile they are as a class. That every time you have a, a new variant come, uh, it appears to knock off some of the monoclonal antibody. And I'm showing you here, uh, BAM, Eddy, BAM, Anisevimab, Casarimab, and Devimab, Sotrovimab, Betrovimab, and Tixigamab, Sogamab. This is Evusheld on the far right. And this is only um, for uh, prevention. And you can see that you know with alpha, gamma, delta, uh, and omicron, and, and between the omicron subvariants, you're kind of seeing uh, whittling away of our monoclonal antibody um, options. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at uh, antivirals, oral antivirals, both Paxlovid and, and monopiravir, it actually appears to be active against all of these. Um, and in addition, it has activity against SARS-1 and MERS and, and other coronaviruses as well. And this is um, viral kind of, this is a viral suppression curve, you can call it like that, with different concentrations of nermatrovir, ritonavir against all of these different um, coronaviruses. So it not only is it, is it active against multiple SARS-CoV-2 variants, but also active against different, different um, uh, uh, coronaviruses as well. And why is that? Um, well, it goes down to, the target of action, right? So um, the target, the protease gene for um, for, for the coronaviruses is, and, and also RNA polymerase is far more conserved. I'm showing you some of the mutations. So, so the dark boxes show um, kind of high level mutations or mut common mutations. Um, up top here is the region for the protease gene, about 300 amino acids. So, and then on the bottom, it's a receptor binding domain where, where the monoclonal antibodies bind. And you can see that there's, and with fragments that are relatively the same size, you can see that there's just a lot more mutations in spike than there is in the protease gene. And 
you know, Spike is just a lot more flexible. It's built to handle more mutations since it needs to escape from uh, various immune responses. But you don't see the same flexibility in the protease because I think having changes in the protease will really adversely affect the function uh, of the enzyme. Now, this is not to say that resistance can't occur because we've seen protease inhibitor resistance in HIV, for example. It's just that it'll take more mutations and likely lead to some kind of a fitness cost when it comes to the virus. Now, I am going to circle back to the second poll where I asked about what is true about monopyridine. And the answer was number four, all of the above, that it works by inducing errors during the viral RNA replication step, that it's not recommended in pregnancy because it wasn't studied. And also there's this concern about mutagenesis. And three, that resistance has been quite rare when it comes to all of these oral um, antivirals. All right, let's go to the last section. What's next? So um, there, as I mentioned, there's been some real, real world observational studies looking at monopyridine paxlovid, but really none that's really tested them head to head until now. There is an ongoing trial in the UK called the Panoramic Trial that is comparing monopyridine versus um, nematuria ritonavir or paxlovid. Yeah, they only added Nermatrovir, it's a platform trial, but they only added nermatrovir in April. And so now they're enrolling patients. Um, their goal is to get about 5,000 patients um, within each arm. So um, no results are available, but that's one trial to keep an eye on because um, that's looking head to head, nermatrovir versus, um, versus monopyrivir. I also want to um, mention that there's been other oral antivirals that's been tried, but that hasn't worked. Uh, one example of that is Camostat. Um, it's a, also a um, protease inhibitor, but it, instead of binding to the, um, to the viral protease, it actually binds to this host protease called Tempers 2. Tempers 2 is thought to play a pretty vital role in SARS-CoV-2 cellular entry um, by um, cleaving part of the spike and allowing spike to be in the conformation that allows it to, to help it, it enter into a cell. And in, in, in um, both kind of cell model and animal model data has that appear to have activity. It's also been approved in Asia for the treatment of pancreatitis. So there's a pretty you know, accumulation of reassuring safety data. But in a phase two study in the active two trial, um, as you can see here um, on the left here, there's no impact of camostat on viral clearance. And on the right, there's really no impact of camostat on rates of hospitalization or death. So you know, why didn't Camostat work? Well, it turns out that SARS-CoV-2 can enter a cell potentially through a Tempers-2 independent pathway uh, and can get around this blockade. And I think the studies like this highlight the important role that rigorous randomized trials play in, in vetting uh, antivirals. And this is especially important because we are using antivirals for COVID-19 and monkeypox that has not gone through phase three trials. So, and then, I, and then lastly, I want to talk about this new anti oral antiviral that's on the horizon. This is also an, a 3CL protease inhibitor similar to nematrovir, but it has a longer half-life, which allows it to have only one daily dosing and there's no need for ritonavir. And because it has a prolonged drug exposure at the end of therapy, um, it may be less prone to a, a COVID rebound after the end of, of treatment. And, Phase two studies have shown a significantly greater decline in infectious viral titers. It's currently um, being tested as part of active 2D, uh, which I am a, a part of the study team. And it's testing, uh, it's enrolling patients with less than equal to five days of symptoms, um, not on oxygen, outpatients treated with either for either randomized to either five days of, of this new drug or five days of placebo. It's enrolling both high risk and low risk um, participants. Now, uh, one important point is that in the U.S., we are only enrolling low-risk patients because the FDA felt that the high-risk patients, um, at this point at least, should try to go on Paxlovid if they can. Um, high-risk patients, so will be, at this point, enrolled primarily outside the U.S. where Paxlovid is not easily um, accessible. So this uh, study is ongoing. The objectives is really to look at improving the time to sustain symptom resolution, as well as a number of secondary objectives looking at viral load and, and um, hospitalizations and, and death. So a couple of key take-home points from this talk. One, Omicron and subvariants are dominant in the U.S. Nermatrovir is a treatment of choice 
for high-risk outpatients. It works by inhibiting the viral protease enzyme. Uh, Epic HR showed an 89% decreased risk of hospitalization and death. It's been linked to post-treatment rebound of symptoms and infectious virus. In the absence of antiviral treatment, symptom rebound is common, although the combination of high-level viral and symptom rebound is rare. Um, some observational studies have seen benefit in vaccinated patients, and drug-drug interactions um, should be closely monitored. And finally, uh, uh, monopiravir is an alternative treatment for high-risk outpatients, works by inducing errors in viral RNA. Seen in phase three trials, about a 30% decreased risk of hospitalizations, but there was a unexpected difference between the first half and the second half of the study. And there's some concern about mutagenesis of host DNA. In contrast, molecule antibodies, the risk of resistance appeared low for nermatrivir, ritonavir, and monopiravir. And there are ongoing trials comparing the oral antiviral and new oral uh, therapy. So um, I'm just going to go through uh, again, circle back to the two uh, questions that I posed at the very beginning. One, your patient comes in with questions. Oh, anyway, here we go. Your patient comes in with questions regarding current COVID-19 therapy. Which of the one, which of the following is true? Current oral therapies include nermatrivir, um, uh, Paxlovid, uh, monofuric, and remdesivir. Nermatrivir is only is the only preferred oral antiviral therapy in the NIH guidelines. Nermatrivir and monofuric are both pre preferred oral antiviral therapies, or the Omicron BA.5 is resistant to all. And here are the results. All right, good. So the results are looking much better now. So nermatrivir is the only preferred oral antivirals. Excellent, great, uh, and uh, perfect. Um, uh, Monofuvir is a alternative agent, um, as I mentioned. And the second question, you're seeing a 40-year-old woman with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, recent diagnosis of COVID-19, which one's true. Nermatrivir is likely to be a clinical benefit even if she's vaccinated. Nermatrivir has relatively few drug-drug interactions. Monofuravir should be the treatment of choice or she should be warned about dysgeusia, unusual taste if she is prescribed monopiravir. Ah, uh, wow, warms my heart. So perfect, 93% got the right answer. Um, no matter what time here, should still be, well, there's some evidence now that it should still be active even for high risk patients, even if they've been uh, vaccinated, but they're, and they have, have a lot of drug drug interactions. Uh, and uh, it's, um, the dys dysgeusia is actually for um, nermatrivir and not for monopiravir, so. Thank you, and that is it. I'm going to stop my sharing. I'm happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was really phenomenal. You got into explaining a lot of things that I think have been on people's minds. And I think your talk also really highlights how challenging it's been to do trials and interpret them and use them in clinical practice in the setting of a pandemic that's evolving. So I think you really did a great job of highlighting all of those challenges along the way. So um, we have some questions and I'll, I'll just jump right into them. Um, the first one is about um, just, we were talking about resistance at the end and, and we, you know, I think you were really focused on oral antivirals, but with regard to monoclonals and resistance, just more recently, has resistance been developed, uh, been um, reported yet for this new BA 4.6 um, Omicron variant? Do we know if there's any, uh, any data about that yet? Yeah, so again, monoclonal antibodies, uh, we had really high hopes for them and they, you know, they're still useful. Um, at this point, but one of the concerns is um, resistance, uh, both emerging from treatment, but also when it comes to some of these new variants. BA.4.6 is now 10% of the US population. 
it um, it is increasing slowly, but you know, slowly kind of nudging out BA.5. The one concern about BA.6, 0.4.6, is Evusheld. There has been some in vitro data that Evusheld is not active against BA.4.6. Um, Betulimumab is still active. Um, BA.4.6 is predominantly, or there's the highest levels are in the Midwest, uh, where it's getting close to about 20% or so. So something to keep an eye on right now. Um, I will say that there's also been some modeling that there are other Omicron subvariants that are more fit than BA.4.6, including 2.75. So if you're going to root for one, I would root for 2.75 rather than BA.4.6. But anyway, it, it is we need to keep an eye on it for, for Evusheld, which, as you, as you mentioned, is really important for, uh, uh, as you know, for pre-exposure prophylaxis for our immunosuppressed um, individuals, patients. Yeah, and there actually was a question about that. I know it wasn't the focus of your talk, but specifically Evusheld for prevention, is it available to people living with HIV who have multiple comorbidities? Is that considered a risk group for prevention? Yeah, so um, what is considered kind of uh, immuno... So Evusheld, um, Tixic Evimaxic Evimab, is authorized for immunosuppressed patients who, uh, for pre-exposure prophylaxis, right? What is defined as, as um, immunosuppressed, there is a list that came with the, um, with the, the, the EUA uh, fact sheet, but the fact sheet also says that that list is not necessarily fully comprehensive, <laughs> that depending on, you know, kind of the, the relative status of someone's HIV or someone's, um, uh, you know, kind of other immunosuppressive conditions, that, that there's some gray areas that I think, I think at least patients who have um, who are definitely kind of untreated or have somewhat lower CD4 counts would I, I think would, would definitely qualify um, but there is there is a gray area there for people who are have really high CD4 counts and, and, and are and are you know doing well on treatment. Great. Some great questions about the rebound. And I think you did a really nice job of, of um, showing that data from what happens in the absence of treatment. Um, but is um, one question is, is Paxlovid rebound like iris in early HIV? Uh, when Can you make any parallels between that? Oh, that is a really interesting um, suggestion. And I, I think there is maybe a little bit of parallel there. Um, in the sense that uh, iris occurs because on antiretroviral therapy and someone who has an opportunity infection with antiretroviral therapy, their immune system rebounds and 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 can then start attacking the, the opportunistic infection. Um, in this case, I think it's a slightly different mechanism in the sense that I think Paxlovid keeps the viral load and the viral replication low while the immune system is kind of coming up and, and actually maturing. And then the virus, uh, the Paxlovid wanes because its half-life is so short and the virus kind of all of a sudden rebounds quickly, but then the immune system has already kind of started kicking in and, and can lead to a, to a symptom. So there is some parallels there in that both can be caused by a maturing or an improved immune system against an, an ongoing infection. So there is some parallels there. Yeah, in fact, somebody asked whether the viral rebound has been correlated with the IgM to IgG transition in the immune response. I, I, I mean, it, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's been, um, I think people are trying to study, study the very early days after Paxlovid treatment and during Paxlovid rebound. But um, uh, yeah, there hasn't been that kind of granularity in terms of IgM, IgG, I, don't, I haven't seen that kind of data yet, but that's a good, good question though. And so would you say it's fair to say that we don't yet know if longer treatment would prevent rebound? Yes, I, I think um, I, I, as, as we saw on the, on the, uh, in the poll, it sounds like there are some people have been using uh, slightly longer courses, uh, including a 10 day course. Uh, of course, you know, that is not, actually kind of authorized by the FDA. Um, I think there's a lot of speculation that giving 10 days would help prevent viral rebound, but we just don't have any of that data. Now, I, I do wanna mention that when I prescribe Paxlovid, I do talk to my patients about this rebound syndrome. And I say, hey, this is something that you should watch out for, that symptoms might recur. You might become antigen positive again. If it does happen, you should make sure to isolate again because we have shown that you might be shedding infectious virus again for, for quite a bit of time. But 
Having said that, all you know, the Epic HR phase three studies and all of these other studies that I just mentioned showed pretty dramatic benefits when it comes to hospitalizations and death, despite rebound. And we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And the prize is preventing hospitalizations and death. And, and so it is an inconvenience for our patients to have rebound, um, but generally rebound is relatively mild. And I think overall, it, it, Paxlovid, I still recommend it because it still prevents what I care about, which is severe disease. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think it's also some of the preliminary data suggests that people who have rebound don't go on to get hospitalized. So it's not a, it's not a sign of impending doom. It's a dis, it's a annoyance, but it's not that they've then gone on to get sick. So more information needed. I think that your answer is great. So some questions about um, dealing with the drug interactions. And, and um, I, I think this people have been tempted with this. this. The question is, you know, when you have somebody who has is immunosuppressed and takes a drug like tacrolimus with an absolute contraindication to uh, Paxlovid, would, would, it, would you ever consider just giving the, um, the uh, nermotrelivir and not the ritonavir. This is an off-label uh, suggestion, but I know that people have been tempted, so please answer. Uh, I, I would personally not do it. I think you're not, as I, as I showed early on in the pharmacokinetics, if you, well, first of all, if you don't have ritonavir, don't, if you don't have the right dose of ritonavir, right, that you are not gonna get appropriate levels of nermatra ritonavir, that you're not gonna get levels that are sufficient potentially for um, for suppression, for a su for suppression, and for suppression for a, for a significant amount of time, for the recommended amount of time, and that is going to lead to problems, and that could lead to drug resistance. Uh, I, I would not recommend um, going off label and not using uh, the ritonavir. And then, in terms of um, the drug interactions, you talked about the Shinogi oral antiviral that doesn't use ritonavir. Can you comment on whether it still has uh, drug interactions? Um, and if they are as extensive as with um, Paxlovid, or do we yeah, know? So, um, it, it, so I, I will say that um, uh, the Shinogi product uh, is still a cytochrome P450 inhibitor. So it does not remove all drug-drug interactions. Um, I think it's expected to have maybe less high-risk drug-drug interactions because it doesn't need ritonavir, but I, I think there are still some concerns out there. And then Judy, you know, a ton about this as well. I, I feel free to chime in here as well on this question. Yeah, I think we're we're getting more information, but it does still have significant. It does still have drug interactions that need to be we need to be concerned about. Yeah, but anytime you can get rid of ritonavir, I think <laughs> that would be good. Yes. Um, so here's a, a an interesting question about resistance um, from Ray Shinazi. Um, the T1901 and the Y54C are natural mutations that confer resistance to Paxlovid. Do you know if if anyone has looked at whether those pre-existing mutations were there in those who um, who had rebound or failed treatment? Yeah. So really, at this point, we've looked in our studies. We've looked in um, or other groups, several other groups have published Paxlovid rebound studies. No one has seen any resistance mutations uh, naturally occurring or not that would be expected to decrease Paxlovid efficacy. So luckily, as, as of right now, we don't see any indication that, um, that Paxlovid resistance is common and that Paxlovid has any kind of low barrier resistance that we think is a high barrier resistance and that natural um, resistance to it is very, very rare and um, does not appear to be induced by, even during rebound right now. I will say the one um, group that I'm always kind of concerned about and I keep a close eye on are, are immunosuppressed um, individuals. Um, when it comes to monoclonal antibodies, we've seen that um, for citrovimab, for example, there's reports of, of resistance in immunosuppressed populations. And those are the patients who have prolonged high levels of viral loads. And if anyone's gonna develop resistance, I think those are the patients who are most likely to. So I, I really think that that is an area that has been highly understudied immunosuppressed individuals and that we need to do a better job um, really doing surveillance studies and really focusing on that high priority, high risk patient population. 
Yeah, here's another question that maybe relates to that a little bit too. A patient age 70 had Paxlovid for fevers and initially was PCR positive and three weeks, weeks later is still PCR positive. How long can people stay PCR positive um, in, during the course of, of, of um, COVID? Right. So we actually, so first of all, there is a difference between PCR and antigen. I think most of you know this, that um, PCR um, measures, can, can, is highly sensitive, can measure just tiny pieces of viral RNA. So, um, and we've seen that even early during the pandemic, where, where patients still were positive, even weeks and weeks out from their initial acute infection, even though their symptoms had really largely waned. And then we kind of realized, well, those CT values were really high, which means that the viral load is very low. Uh, and so just having a positive um, uh, RNA uh, level by PCR doesn't necessarily confer, uh, uh, concern me even three weeks out um, from treatment or from Paxil to rebound, um, especially if the CT values are very high, if you have access to those CT values. If the antigens level um, is still positive three, four weeks out, maybe that's a little bit more concerning, I would say. But, but this I am not as concerned about. It can, it can be weeks before the RNA uh, PCR becomes, becomes negative. And of course, immunosuppressed patients can have chronic infections. And those are the patient populations that, that, that I would be concerned for, for chronic infection. Um, questions about this, these differences between the molnupiravir and the um, Paxlovid trials in, in terms of seropositivity rate, geography, BMI, time to starting treatment, whether, whether people who enrolled were excluded from a EPIC HR because of drug interactions might have been different. So, and I, I guess it really boils down to this new panoramic trial, which is going to compare these agents head to head. Can you just say a little more about that trial? Are they, are people being randomized head to head in the study? And, and when do you think results will be available? Because I think that will help to put some of these questions to rest. Right. So the panoramic trial, I think will hopefully be the definitive trial here when it comes to uh, looking at monoperior versus Paxlovid. There are people who don't have, uh, who, who can't receive one or the other. And if that's the case, they get randomized to either um, monoperior and standard of care or Paxlovid standard of care. But if they can get randomized to, to either, then they get, then, then you get randomized to one or the other and compared head to head. They're enrolling, I think, 15, uh, 5,000 uh, patients per arm. I, I don't know. I think they started enrolling Paxlovid patients in April, but I haven't heard how close they are to finishing. I don't know if you've heard anything about that, Judy. I, I don't have any, any additional information. Um, the next question from Orbit Clanton, I think, Orbit, for asking this question is about, you know, how we define high risk. And people with hypertension are considered high risk, but what if the hypertension is well controlled? Should we continue to think of well controlled hypertension as a risk, as a high risk factor? And how do you work that into um, your decisions about treatment? Yeah, in my mind, great question, first of all. <laughs> No, no, no necessarily one right answer here, but I would say that risk in my mind is a spectrum that you've got patients with older, multiple risk factors. They're over here. You've got younger patients with maybe a, a, a little bit of hypertension, maybe even well-controlled on, on, on drug on the far other end of the spectrum. And my decisions on treatment, whether we give nermatrovirtanavir is going to depend on where they are on this spectrum. And someone who is young, maybe one well-controlled risk factor, well, it's going to be, in my mind, uh, a shared decision-making. Maybe, maybe they really can't afford to, to, um, uh, uh, to have a COVID rebound and have to isolate a second time. And they, and they can't, you know, they are, you know, and, and their symptoms are relatively mild and they're actually getting better. Maybe I don't necessarily say you have to take Paxlovid for those individuals, but for someone who is high, high risk, you know, maybe I'm going to recommend it far more strongly. So as he said, hypertension well-controlled, a little, definitely on the lower end of the of the spectrum uh, when it comes to risk in that case. Yeah, and I think that this is evolving, right? As the as the pandemic goes on and variants change, and people are vaccinated and boosted and boosted right. again, exactly. um, we're learning more about the natural history and risk of hospitalization, and it is making hospitalization as an endpoint much more challenging for conducting studies. So it's clear we need other surrogates to evaluate new treatments if we expect to ever bring new treatments into the scene. So back to virology again we go. 
John, I want to thank you for a really outstanding presentation and also our audience for submitting such great questions and for participating today. Um, it's really been a, a pleasure to moderate this discussion and I want to thank everyone at IAS USA for getting us all together so that we could have the opportunity to talk about this important topic. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a blast to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for, for joining us. And again, thank you, Dr. Courier and Dr. Lee for a very highly informative discussion and for Dr. Lee for developing and presenting this webinar. As a reminder to our audience, evaluation and information on how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. Here are a list of upcoming webinars that we have. Next week, we have a rapid review of data presented at AIDS 2022 with Dr. Paul Sachs from Harvard Medical School. This week, we have a September dialogue on monkeypox and COVID-19. So if you have not registered yet, please do so at the IAS USA website. And we have a December 8th course, the IAS USA 30th annual update on HIV management in Chicago. Again, registration information is available on our website. And the annual Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Clinical Conference will be held in San Diego from October 16th through October 18th. And lastly, as a reminder to our audience, um, general abstract and scholarship submissions for CROI are now open. The deadline is next week on Tuesday, September 20th. For more information, please visit the CROI conference website. Thank you, everyone. And this concludes today's webinar.